Good morning, Pastor Ron Jetter, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Grandview, Washington, Friday the 29th of January, 2021, the fifth time this month, this year, that I have said TGIF. Wow. Five Fridays in a month, five Saturdays, and five Sundays. Five weekends in one month. That doesn't happen very often. I mean, in, in fact, for it has to be a 31-day month to have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday occur three times in a given month. November had five weekends, uh, but it wasn't three-day weekends. This one, wow. If only every month were like that. Yeah, every month I had 31 days, and there were always five weekends. Yeah, you'd start off with a weekend, you'd end with a weekend. Well, of course, we wouldn't get enough work done to... To feed ourselves and to be productive, I suppose the 40-hour week is is really pretty pretty cushy compared to what they had to do way back when to work and and our think of our grandparents and our great grandparents putting food on the table was what they did that was their primary activity with all their waking hours and if they were fixing or mending or building something it still had as its end purpose, sustaining life, food, shelter, clothing, safety, the basics. Leisure time was still rare, which is why God commanded one day a week for rest so that you weren't working yourself all the time. One day to read, to reflect, to pray, to be with the family, to enjoy a meal together around the table. Chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Numbers deal with the story that explains why Moses is not going to enter the land of Canaan. They're close. They can see the land. They're on the edge of the land. They're probably ready to begin strategizing. But remember, it's not up to them. It's up to God. And we've got a group who says, let's go. And they are now planning a battle. And Moses says, we need to send scouts. So Moses appointed two of the younger people, the next generation, Caleb, son of Jehuna, and Joshua, son of Nun. They will be the leaders when Moses' generation has passed away. I kind of know what it feels like. When my parents died, I thought, wow, it's my generation. And my generation will go the way of my parents' generation. And it will be my kids' generation. Uh, every generation rises and we have our day in the sun. And then we fade and wither like the grass, and like the flowers of the field. And the next one comes into the sun and blossoms. And then it too goes on. Such is the circle of life. God watches over all, and God watched over Israel and was preparing them for the conquest of the land of Canaan, the land he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors, their patriarchs. So Joshua and Caleb take with them scouts, and they go into the land, and they notice in the land two things. Number one, there are herds, goats, cattle, sheep, and pasture land, and there's water for these. And then there are also vines and orchards, and it must be near the season of harvest because it says they were able to return with figs and with pomegranates. The other thing they noticed was that some of the people had actually built fortified cities and they would have built them out of, out of bricks made from the, the soil and the clay. They didn't have a lot of wood, but some wood enough, but mostly walled cities. We know that the city of Jericho uh, was built probably around uh, eight to 10,000 years before the time of Jesus. And it's, it's, as far as we know, the oldest example of a walled city uh, on the planet, right there in, in uh, Israel, in, in what we call the ancient Near East. Uh, the news calls it the Middle East. It is not the Middle East, it is the Near East, the Near East. 
Um, so they, they get their geography wrong and then they keep telling the same mistruth. That's what news does. And sometimes they just call it Mideast. Well, it's the Near East. And we call it the ancient Near East because it's 3,200 years ago. We know what grew in the land. We knew they had walled cities. And that meant that the people then knew how to protect themselves, that they expected invasions from time to time. Other tra tribes were probably more nomadic and would come through the land as, as conditions changed. We know that from our own, uh, the natives and the indigenous peoples in the Americas that as the seasons would change, the tribes were migratory. They would use the resources in one area and then they would move south with the winter and back north with the summer to follow growing seasons because they needed a food supply. They were not for the most part agrarian. Some of them were, they could grow things and then harvest, but then they would also take what they harvested and move. Uh, but they were mostly hunters and gatherers. Uh, even the ones who were agrarian then still had to have ways to protect their land. And in the Near East, that was certainly true. So, so Joshua and Caleb take a report back to Moses and they tell him these two things. They show him the fruit and then they show him or they tell him about the walled cities and the fortified uh, areas and the people. But the rest of the group with them had conspired against Joshua and Caleb to create a false report saying to Moses, these guys are underestimating how difficult it will be. They're, first of all, huge. We're like grasshoppers to them. And I love that it. it says, we are like grasshoppers to them. They are descended from the Nephilim. And Nephilim, we have to go clear back into the book of Genesis. Angelic beings inhabiting the earth. Nephilim. Uh, it's one of these categories of, of non-human, superhuman, extra-human, extra-terrestrial, uh, godlike beings, and they're giants. Uh, it's interesting that they have these stories. Think of ancient Greece. They have stories of the gods who are larger than life with tremendous powers beyond normal earthly powers. So these stories exist. Where did they come from? There must have been something to them. So the false report then is given to Moses and Moses is now caught between three factions. He's got Joshua and Caleb giving him a true report saying, if we're gonna conquer the land, we need to know how we're gonna do it. We gotta have a plan. And they both believe God will guide that plan. Moses knows this too, but there's also the ones who are saying, oh, we can never do this. God lied to us. We should have just died. We should have never, and they're spreading this story. We should have died in Egypt as slaves. It would have been better. So they're grumbling against God. And then there's a group saying, why are we waiting on God? We're armed. We're ready. We're packing. Let's attack now. Three groups. One saying, we have to take the land now. One saying, we can never take the land. And one saying, we need to wait on the Lord and we will take the land in the Lord's day. And the Lord finally gets tired of it and says, Moses, sorry, you and your generation are going to die here in the wilderness. You don't get to go into the land. That's it. I'm tired of it. You have experienced so many blessings and all you've done is curse and doubt and grumble and crave and worship other gods and disobey. You will see the land, but you will not step foot in it. That's for your children, the generation born in the wilderness who never knew slavery. They will be the ones following Joshua and Caleb in the conquest of Canaan, in the stories that come after the book of Numbers. We have this interesting detail to finish up chapter 15. Fringes on garments. Chapter 15 completely shifts the story back to, oh, by the way, Moses, when you go into the land, here's the offering you make. As if to ignore 13, 14, where Moses has been told, you're not going to go into the land. 
So again, these different traditions woven together, they don't have to be, uh, to be somehow lineal. That's not the purpose. They're trying to tell the story from different aspects. And this is again, these priestly details. And here's this interesting one. Verse 37, chapter 15 of the book of Numbers, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites, tell them to make fringes on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue cord on the fringe at each corner so that when you have the fringe and when you see it, you will remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Not follow your own lusts of the heart and your own eyes. So the cords, the fringe on the garments, remember Tevye, Fiddler on the Roof, he had his, his uh, prayer shawl with the frills on it, or he had his vest with the frills on it and the blue cord woven through it. There are many Orthodox Jews to this day who still follow this. Thanks. See you tomorrow for the final episode.